in America, they call it a public intellectual. But I'm not using that because it's ridiculous. <laughs> the other one they do in America is they invite you to conferences and they're like, we just really wanted you as a thought leader. <laughs> a thought leader. We're reaching out to you as a thought leader. <laughs> what does that mean? Hi, I'm Brady Harron. Today's guest on the Number File podcast is the public intellectual and thought leader, Hannah Fry. Hannah's a mathematician at University College London, or UCL, and we'll be talking about her work shortly. But in recent years, Hannah's also become something of a celebrity. She's written books, fronted BBC TV shows, she makes radio programs and podcasts, and occasionally, when time permits, even pops up in the odd number file video. So as you can guess, there's a lot I wanted to ask her about. Let's start close to the beginning. What were you like as a little girl? Like, would I have known, oh, she's going to end up being a mathematician? Hmm, not early on. No, I don't think so. Not like as a kid. When I was about 11, I think that's when it sort of started to change, really. And I pinpoint it to one particular event, which is um, my Irish mother has a slightly skewed idea of what constitutes a fun summer holiday. So one summer she bought me a maths textbook and insisted that I go through a single page in this textbook every day before I was allowed to have any fun. Um, which you can imagine my delight as an 11-year-old. Like to give you education, like to be wholesome or thinking that little Hadda would find this fun? Uh, I'm not sure really. She's just like really, really into education. She always has been. So, you know, her and her family really didn't get very much education. My dad left school when he was really young and I think that she was really just, it had this totally inbuilt idea that education is the way that you kind of get yourself anywhere so she was just very very strict about education the whole way through so it's just kind of continuing that idea but I think what happened though with that sort of summer is that then when I went back to school afterwards actually I must have been 10 because I was still in primary school so I must have been 10 then when we were doing stuff in maths class I just had seen it all before really I knew what was coming and I just totally got it and at that point then it just becomes much more of a playground, right? When you're ahead of the class, it's just way more fun. And I think that, yeah, that's when I started playing with it a lot more. So it's not like when you were doing those textbook exercises on holiday, you were enjoying that, but it gave you this skill later on that put you ahead of the curve, which then allowed you to look at mathematics in a more fun way later. It's like set you up. I don't know, maybe I'm being a bit naive, but I think everyone quite likes doing problems when they get them right, don't they? Everyone quite likes it when you get a puzzle correct. So it's only that first bit that's horrible. And then when you're sort of in the exercises in the back of the textbook, the first couple are horrible because you don't know what's happening. But then once you get it, you're like, yeah, I'm sailing. It's not like I was kind of getting up in the morning and self-motivating myself to sit down and do some of this textbook that I had someone standing over me. <laughs> so, yeah, Because a lot of the mathematicians I speak to when they talk about their childhood like confess to being a nerd they're like yeah I was a bit of a nerd <laughs> were you a nerd yes you were yeah totally wholeheartedly a complete nerd I mean what else can you say <laughs> I was what, a what, picture a nerd yeah. and that was me like give me an example of something nerdy you would do besides being good at mathematics <laughs> I took extra a-level maths modules just because I wanted to right it's quite nerdy and was that because you were like wanting to be an alpha overachiever or because you just loved mathematics? Probably both. <laughs> right. Like I once just wrote a book in the summer. What was it about? It was, <laughs> it was so <laughs> shit. <laughs> Am I allowed to swear on this one? I don't know. I just did. You just did. All right. <laughs> it was a novel. Yeah. <laughs> I can't believe I'm telling you this. What was it about? Like what it was, was called, it was about um, a guy who has a car crash hmm. and loses the ability to walk and then learns to walk again after it makes friends with a bird in the garden. How old were you at this point? Like maybe 11 or 12. Okay. Was it the bird that made him able to walk? Like yeah. Did it have magic powers or <laughs> it wasn't super? It was it super I think it was like encouraging him to walk. So it'd like sit on his shoulder and then like kind of. <laughs> All right. It could talk. <laughs> no, no. But he was like, he would be friendly with him, try and get him to sort of sit on his hand. And then the bird would just be slightly too far away. So he'd have to kind of reach for it. What was the hero's name? Do you remember? No, I can't remember. You really don't remember? My, no, I can't. But my mum found this book when she was going through the attic a little while ago. And she wrapped it up and gave it to me for my 30th birthday. So I've got it at home. It still exists. Yeah, yeah. It's, and, and I even got a friend of mine 
<laughs> he was also like 11 to illustrate it for me. So it's got like an illustrated cover and everything. I so want to have to see this book. <laughs> what was its name? It was called Free as a Bird. Oh. It's so shit. <laughs> You know, when you think you're like this real literary genius when you're like 10. No, I'm impressed by that. I'm impressed by that. So you weren't 100% like science and math then. You were showing a bit of a, a humanities bent at this point. No, I think I was just a nerd, mate. <laughs> I think I was just a nerd. At what point did it become evident that you were actually going to be like a professional mathematician? Like was this, this was actually going to end up being my job? Oh, I don't think that happened until it actually happened, really. Right. I mean, what I really wanted to do was work in Formula One. That was like my single-minded ambition. Well, this is motor racing. Motor racing, exactly. That was that was what I really wanted to work in. Because my dad used to race motorbikes professionally. Hmm. So, like, our family is just very into kind of racing. And I just massively, massively loved Formula One. I just wanted a way to work in it. And engineering just wasn't really on the table. I don't know. It never occurred to me that that was a kind of career option. I went to an all-girls school and just no one ever spoke about it really. So because I was good at maths, I, I went and did maths at university. Although actually what I wanted to do when I was 16, although I was a massive nerd, what I really wanted to do was be a hairdresser. Right. And my mum was like, okay, <clears throat> what we'll do, you just do your A-levels and then we'll talk about this again. So I did maths, physics and chemistry A-levels. And then after I did my A-levels, I was like, you know, I still would quite like to do a hairdressing course. My mum was like, tell you what, just go off to university and do an undergraduate degree in maths with theoretical physics. And then after that, <laughs> then we'll talk about hairdressing. We'll talk about it. And then, uh, yeah, by the time I'd finished my PhD, I was like, probably not going to be a hairdresser. Why do you think you wanted to be a hairdresser? It's just cool. Like, have you ever been and look, like watched what a hairdresser does? It's cool. They just like cut and do things to yeah, people's no, hair. They like do magic stuff. They like make it all. <laughs> so it was the it was the process. Like you liked the idea of doing the processes that they do, the craft. Yeah, the craft of it, and also, but also, I think there's something quite nice about you know having a process that's quite short where you get to see the end result very quickly. It's kind of the reason why I like doing YouTube videos because you have an idea, you execute the idea and then and then it's sort of out there. It's not like this really long thing that lasts for ages and ages before you know whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. Short turnaround time. Yeah. So when you started studying mathematics properly at university, like did it take quickly? Was it like, yeah, this is still holding my brain? Well, obviously it was because it became your job, but like you started to realize this was going to be your job now. Like you're all in. Yeah. So I just, I just always love it. It's just so delicious. And so, I mean, I've always just played with it and massively, massively enjoyed it. But I did actually make my dream. I did manage to get to Formula One. So after I finished my PhD, which was in aerodynamics, I was kind of incrementally getting closer and closer to working in Formula One. So this was st this was a plan, like you were aiming for Formula One, yeah. you were like making choices that would get you closer. Yeah, it totally was. I was, I was picking things that I was enjoying doing at the same time, hmm. but was kind of edging towards it. And then I eventually got there. I just hated it because there wasn't enough maths in it. <laughs> What did you do? So I was doing, I worked for an aerodynamics consultancy firm. Right. So we were designing the wings on cars like Ferrari or like Lotus or like yeah. um, HRT as it was at the time. Yeah. I had imagined that what this would be would be a group of people sitting around a, a chalkboard coming up with loads of really clever ideas, writing equations, you know, just thinking about the physics of it, thinking about the, the mathematics of it. Yeah. And it just wasn't like that at all, basically. What was it like? <laughs> all of these, the really nice stuff has already been wrapped up in, in computer simulations. So you were just setting up runs on your computer overnight and then coming in in the morning and like picking the picture that just had the least amount of blue in it. It's like chucking darts, basically. And if you chuck enough darts, something's going to hit. It was just, boring really so you thought you'd be coming into work and say i've had a whole new idea for the way we should design the wing and we're going to completely revolutionize it and we'd all go and but it wasn't it was just like you were just like grunt work yeah exactly exactly that grunt work so that i think was the point where i was like no i'd rather be a professional mathematician thanks very much do you still like formula one yeah i do although i haven't really watched it that much this season just because i've liked it this season have you yeah. i know i just i just haven't been around really just yeah. too much too much going on on yeah. sundays Okay. Worked too much, basically. When you watch Formula One now, do you look at it differently because of that time you spent working in the behind the scenes with the? No, I think I still massively enjoy it yeah. in the same way. I think you realise just how superficial the information that you get from the broadcast version is, just how much more 
unbelievably delicious technical detail there is going on behind the scenes that you just don't have access to. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, the reason why I like Formula One is because it's just a gigantic maths competition, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. But also a big like politics. Yeah, comp- completely. It's like a big political thing as well and a big like business financial thing. It's yeah, like... totally. With a bit of danger thrown in, a bit yeah. of jeopardy. Yeah. Can I ask you a gender thing about university? Mm. Were there lots of women, girls on your course or was it very male dominated? I would say when I went, it was about mm, maybe a third were girls. Okay. Maybe a bit less, actually. Maybe between a quarter and a third for undergrad. So it wasn't crazy. It wasn't like you were the lone woman in the course. It was like No, you know, no, not as an undergrad. Yeah. There were there were other girls around. Yeah. But then as you go up through the sort of stages, so masters and then PhD and then postdoc, basically all the women sort of fall away. Yeah. So then when I was doing my PhD, there were, I would say, maybe 40 PhD students and there was me and two other girls. Okay. When it becomes that much of a minority, does it affect your enjoyment of it or your ability to do it or you're completely blind to it? Like what's it like when there's so few? So I personally never really minded that much. But I know that there was one girl who was doing a PhD. She was a couple of years ahead of me and she dropped out. And I had this conversation with her and she said that actually she just felt incredibly uncomfortable that she would walk into this PhD room. Often when you're doing PhD, you're not, you don't, you work at home a lot. You sort of have days where you're, you're working at home, but really you're just sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> Watching that, countdown. <laughs> that happens quite a lot. Too. Yeah. So, you know, if, if there was no other girls in the office, she'd be the only girl in the office. And she said that she just felt massively intimidated in that environment. She just felt completely uncomfortable in that environment. And it just really put her off. And I think there are some people who do get really put off by it. Because mm. ultimately, you know, people often ask the question of like, why are there so few women in mathematics and like, you know, STEM subjects? And in a way, I mean, I've got some things to say about it, but in a way, the people who you should really ask are the people who left and ask them why they left. The one thing that I will say about it, though, is that, and actually, I think sometimes you can use this to your advantage, but especially when I was younger and especially when I hadn't done much outreach work, people would often assume that you have no idea what you're talking about. So you'd kind of go into a room, especially, you know, if you didn't know anyone and people be having a bit of a mass chat, you're at a conference or something. And people just assume that you're a complete idiot. Yeah. And that I just always really loved that when you could uh, <laughs> just say something and watch people's faces fall. <laughs> yeah. I, I always wished I could speak other languages. So that moment when you're in the <laughs> lift with two people speaking another language who think you don't know what's going on and then you suddenly answer in their language. They're like, oh, how embarrassing. <laughs> That's like the mathematical equivalent of that. It yeah. totally is. Yeah. I, was, I, I was teaching very young. I was sort of 22 when I was teaching my first group of undergraduates. And there was one year when uh, the first year I wrote an exam for these undergraduate students and I went off to go to the exam to monitor the students during it. And they wouldn't let me in the hall because the invigilators were like, we're not allowing any students in. So I kind of argued my way in and they were like, do you have authority to read this exam? I was like, well, I wrote it. So (laughs) I'm going to go with probably yes. (laughs) So going back to leaving the wing factory, Formula One, Mm. How did you get from that back into mathematics? What was the path? It was really straightforward because my PhD supervisor, a fellow of the Royal Society actually, a guy called Professor Frank Smith, who is just, there are few people on earth who I admire more than him. I, I mean, I was only there really for a couple of months, right, before I was like, I'm, I'm done with this. So he had not only sort of set me up with the Formula One stuff because he knew that I wanted to do it, but when he knew that I wasn't enjoying it, he also set me up with a postdoc. So he's a fluid dynamicist, but he'd been dipping his toe in the water of of looking at human behaviour and sort of that overlap between social sciences and mathematics which was a very new area. And he had this postdoc that came up and was like, wanted to know if I wanted to do it. And I did. And yeah, that's it really. So tell me about most of the work you've done. It does sound quite accessible for mathematics. Yeah, completely. Your work. Like how would you explain it? I mean, it's super, super, super applied, right? It's like the most applied math that you can get. So the idea is that you can look at humans as though they're a mathematical system. And there are some things that sort of make sense, right? If you think about a crowd of people, there are analogies there with the way that fluids move, right? Or if you think about, you know, sort of systems of revolutions and, you know, politics, the way it ebbs and flows, there are sort of chaotic moments in there. You know, you can also think about the systems that work through history History that kind of connect up with each other, the networks of people, the way that ideas spread, you know, influence spreads through a population in a similar way to sort of epidemics do. There's lots of little things about people that 
if you take enough of a step back, you can see them as mathematical objects really so that's really the starting point and it sounds like the different things that I've worked on it sounds like they're really disconnected so you know I've worked with the police looking at burglaries at riots at terrorism you know I've worked with retailers looking at where people spend money in, in the sort of retail environment looking at badger culls right uh, <laughs> what other stuff lots of epidemic stuff it sounds like those things are really different from one another but actually underneath them all they have this common theme which is that they're about patterns created by humans that move around in space and time and yeah the sort of theoretical basis of that is actually just a really simple idea what mathematical tools or processes do you use to affect this like what kind of mathematics do you use so there's tons of statistics obviously because if you're starting with a data set and you're analyzing it the first thing that you want to do is to really get a grip with what kind of patterns are in there. But then from there, I mean, you have all kinds of tools, you know, in your toolkit that you want to use. So lots of network stuff that happens quite a lot. But you can build models that are essentially differential equations and then use them to sort of isolate certain situations. Lots of information theory as well, lots of entropy maximization where you're trying to fill in the gaps in your knowledge. All kinds of different things, all kinds of different things. How do you find non-mathematical people respond to this idea of mathematically modeling human behavior because even i feel this like inbuilt resistance to it where it's like you can't do that we're all individuals and you know we can't be predicted by mathematics we're unpredictable and we're, i have free will yeah exactly like and suddenly you're there saying oh i can predict where the next burglary is going to happen or where the next bomb is going to go off or where people are going to walk in a shopping center mm. do you find a resistance to that? Are people very accepting to the fact that you're just treating them like data points? Or I think the difference is it depends on what scale you're talking about. So tomorrow morning, if you were working in an office and you were doing your morning commute, it's certainly true that you can change your mind and you could decide to get a coffee or you can sleep in or, you know, there's all kinds of different things that you might do that are different. So predicting exactly what you're going to do, I'm not always going to get it right. You know, there's limits to how accurate I can be in that regard. But when you scale up to the size of a city, actually that randomness kind of ends up evening itself out. And you can predict with quite a high degree of accuracy how many people are going to pass through a particular station on a given morning. So it's really, I think, that shift is where people can still hold on to their free will, but are still broadly predictable. Have you read the Foundation series then? What, the Asimov stuff? Yeah, psychohistory. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Harry Seldon is the king of your mathematical field. I know, it's so true. Mm. It's so true. Okay. I like to think that the outcome of uh, our stuff is slightly, well, I don't know, <laughs> less terrifying. Is there a holy grail in your field? Like what's the Riemann hypothesis or the like the ultimate thing that could be done in your field that would make that person the king or queen of of this thing like what's the ultimate well so you know a lot of the statistical methods are stepping aside for a lot of machine learning techniques now which are just incredibly powerful at finding these really really subtle patterns so you know for example i mean this is not exactly my area but just for example there are these really beautiful mathematical models that can predict earthquakes and aftershocks right in earthquakes and they've been around for a long time and we, you know, really know the equations very well. Those equations, incidentally, you find a similar pattern in burglaries, which is why I know about them. But now in the last year or so, it's been shown that machine learning techniques are actually better at making these predictions than the beautifully elegant mathematical models are. And it's a similar thing with predicting burglaries or, or predicting whether someone's going to go on to commit a crime in future. You can come up with these really well-crafted, theoretically sound mathematical models, but sometimes all you want is that prediction. And so the, the, there are occasions when the machine learning techniques are, are the better route to go down. But some people sort of say that, you know, as artificial intelligence gets better, if you have artificial general intelligence, then you won't need the mathematical models at all. You know, if you have something that can look at a situation, work out exactly what's going on, predict the future perfectly and not lose any context or nuance in, in the process, then who needs maths? <laughs> well, how do you respond to that um, as a mathematician? I think A, it's a long way away. So yeah. I think I still got a job. Yeah. And B, I think that actually you lose something when you throw away the mathematical model, which is that you lose an understanding of the mechanisms behind those patterns. So it's all very well saying, 
the statistics shows that this area is the one where burglary is going to happen this evening. But if you don't know why, and if you don't know what it is in your model that's driving that that result, then it's very difficult to go in and unpick it and make a positive change for the causes behind it. Like I don't really understand how a car engine works at a proper level. I just know that if it breaks down, I go and get it fixed. Like, so do you always need to know how something works as long as it works? I think, yeah, I think you do, actually. I think if you don't understand how it works, then you can't be sure that it's completely robust. You can't be sure that what you've created isn't just making its decision based on something that isn't part of the, the situation at all. So to give you an example, right, there was this driverless car that was built in like the 90s. And it was called Alvim. And it was amazing. It was an amazing driver's car. I drove thousands of miles, I had a camera on top of it, a neural network running behind the scenes that was working out where to drive. It was brilliant, right? Until they asked Alvin to drive over a bridge, at which point it went completely mad and almost killed the driver or right. the person inside the car. And they worked out what had actually been happening was all of those thousands of miles that it had been driving, it had learned to just drive with the grass on the left-hand side. Right hand side, I guess, because it was probably in America. But there'd always been a verge. It was always nice and simple. And then as soon as there was a bridge and there was no grass, it was kind of essentially hunting for grass, right? Right. And you can end up with a similar situation. If you're hunting for criminals or you're working out where burglaries are happening in the city, you want to be sure that it's really picking up on the signals that you want it to be picking up. I want to ask you something about doing mathematics or being a mathematician. So take away all the other things you do on the side, mm. you know, extracurricular activities and the administration of being an academic and even take away teaching, just like when you're doing your research. Mm. What does that look like? Like, do you come into work with a notepad and a pencil and think, okay, today I'm going to have an idea? Or do you go for a walk around a park? For you, what does the process of doing new mathematics look like so to be honest it's a lot a lot of stuff on the computer where you're crunching through data looking for stuff doing statistics on a machine essentially or when you're building models inside a machine but if you are sort of back to like the pen and paper mathematics where you're designing something designing a model from scratch or you're doing some analysis on your model to try and work out where its limits are or where the weaknesses are or you know how it works in particular situations then you are literally just in a room with the doors closed and a pen and paper and scribbling and then when you get stuck you go for a walk to think it through do you have like a happy place or an inspirational place or a way that you give your brain a little kickstart to start thinking oh your... yeah always on a walk always a walk. on a walk yeah is it the same for you i always have my best ideas when i'm walking i have my best ideas in the shower do you or water or swimming when you're working on a particularly creative project you just find yourself fully immersed in water most of the time <laughs> yeah it's very hard to edit underwater but <laughs> but like i'll go for a swim and have all these amazing ideas and by the time i've like dried off and gotten home and it's time to work again like all the inspiration and motivation's gone but i find water very inspiring but yours is a walk will you walk around like an urban environment or does it have to be like a natural environment no it could be an urban environment too but if i'm working on something and like really kind of embedding myself in it then I try and take my doggy for a nice long walk every day but the reason for it though is exactly what you said about swimming that you can't write stuff down when you're swimming whereas if you go for a walk you can like have a phone with you and kind of take notes and stuff professionally academically what's been your proudest moment like what's been the paper so far mm. that's the one that you're like that was really good that was the one that you would like, you know, show another mathematician to say, <laughs> look, you know, hey. I was pretty good that day. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> the truth is that the one that I like the most in that regard is also the one that no one will ever read. <laughs> Right. <laughs> I mean, it's almost certainly got zero citations, but it took me the longest to write. And it's a paper that I wrote with my PhD supervisor, Frank Smith. And it's where we have taken a very old model of retail behavior and we have bent it out of all recognition into the most delicious mathematical problem imaginable and just played with it to our heart's content. That's my favourite. So this isn't one that like Westfield are going to use because it's no. applicable to their shopping centres. This is no. one where you guys have just gone like freestyle and played with math. I think we turned shopping centres into a one-dimensional continuous line. <laughs> <laughs> right. Do you remember what it's called? Or? I think it's called Rate Effects on the Growth of Centres. Okay. As I said, no one has ever read it. <laughs> we'll link to I it. I like it. We're going to link to it in the notes <laughs> from the show so people can go and have a look. 
obviously in the last few years, a lot of people will know that you're like on TV a lot now and on the internet and on YouTube and radio and podcasts and books and all sorts of things. And we'll talk about a few of them probably shortly. How did that all start? How did you become like outreach person as well? It was just an accident, really. It was never an intention. It was never sort of my ambition. But I did this very stupid talk in a pub, which was about sexual contact networks, right? It's called the friendship paradox. Do you know about this? It's the idea that when you have a network that's structured like a sexual contact network or like a friendship network. So actually the way that Twitter structured is very similar. There's a strange paradox, which is that your friends are more popular than you, essentially. So on Twitter, both the people you follow and the people that follow you will on average have more followers than you do. <laughs> so you're always bottom of the heap. Yeah, I think it's for 95% of users this is true, right? Which is a really strange idea. It's a really kind of weird idea. That's, actually, that doesn't seem possible. It doesn't be- seem possible, does it? The thing is, is that actually the reason why it happens is because a slightly odd quirk of when you use the mean, it illustrates the downside of using the mean. Because you have people on Twitter like Katy Perry, right? Who've got 10 million squillion billion followers. So if you follow her that number so massively dwarfs everyone in your network who's like you, that the people who you follow are then way more popular than you are. But it also happens in the reverse. All it takes is a couple of people who are really popular who follow you and then it skews your numbers too. But it actually has a really interesting implication when it comes to targeting intervention programs for halting the spread of sexually transmitted diseases. This is a really nice idea. Anyway, I did this very stupid talk about it. It has this thing about (laughs) Mick Hucknall being the centre of the hub because apparently he slept with 3,000 people. Okay. This is Mick Hucknall, the singer. Yeah. He's also, I would say, not the most attractive man that's ever walked the earth. No. Well, there are 3,000 people that disagree, (laughs) but all right. Um, So I did this stupid talk about that. Yeah. In a pub. Yeah. Kind of like a comedy night thing. Yeah, yeah. And someone was there who then invited me to go and give another talk that was filmed. Right. Which did really well on the internet. Okay. And then someone saw that and then asked me to do another talk which was a TEDx talk, which I did the maths of love for. Okay. Never expecting anything to happen from it, but it ended up being promoted as a proper TED talk. Okay. And then really it sort of got millions of views and everything really came from there. Okay. And then more and more people started asking you to do more and yeah, more stuff. Yeah, exactly. You said yes to it. So clearly there's something you like about it. So what's been your feelings about now going into this outreach side of things in such a big way? Well, I think that initially... I was a real scaredy cat when I was younger, right? I never, like, pushed myself on anything. I was just like your classic nerd. You know, never went anywhere, never travelled anywhere, never took any risks at all. And so when this stuff started happening, and, and it was people coming to me asking me to do something, right, I just sort of thought, well, I'm just going to say yes because I'd rather live in a world where I said yes and it went badly than I said no and never and didn't know how it would go. So I just had, I had a year where my motto was to say yes, basically. And then actually all of the stuff went quite well. And now I'm in this situation where, you know, I get to like have someone pay for me to go to Dubai and fly in a helicopter over the desert at like sunrise and watch people who've built jetpacks strap them to their back and like chuck themselves out of a helicopter and fly around the desert. I mean, like who the hell wouldn't want that? So is it just the experience of doing it that's motivating you? Do you have like this underlying, I must do outreach for the people, I must bring math to the masses or is that not really like motivating you? I think it's a combination of the two really. I mean, on the one hand, it's like, you know, you only get one life and like, why on earth would I ever turn this stuff down? It's amazing to have these opportunities. But I think on the other hand, I mean, I really do like wholeheartedly believe that maths has got this reputation that it doesn't deserve. And I think it's a massive shame that there is this just glorious living, breathing playground that is just so incredibly wonderful and people just think it deserves to sit in a dusty textbook and be ignored and you know I don't think that you can force people to like the subject I don't think that you can make people into mathematicians who were never going to be mathematicians but I do also think that actually the whole of society has something to gain by just looking at it with a little bit more understanding about what they're actually talking about. Because this side of things really become a big part of your life. Now, I imagine it, m- it must take up a lot of your time because of some of the things you've been involved with, the books and the, the excellent TV programs. How has that affected your ability to still be 
a working mathematician. So actually the biggest thing that affected me being a working mathematician was having a baby. Right. Honest. Okay. So yes. I'm half and half, right? So I'm half a proper academic and I'm half a outreach person, I guess. <laughs> outreach person. Outreach is, that person. What, is that what you would call it? What do you call it? I don't know. In America, they call it a public intellectual. A public intellectual. But I'm not using that because it's ridiculous. You're too late. You said <laughs> it. And you said it in an American accent. <laughs> okay. So half, half. So how do you feel about that? How do you feel about being a half academic? Because it seems like something that, you know, when I hear you talk about your academic life, I see the pleasure it, mm. that it gave you and the happiness and the pride and having to start squashing that more and more because of the other stuff, you know, you, you think you've got the balance right. How do you feel about it? Yeah, I mean, I think so. I'm about to go off on maternity leave again and I think that it's inevitable actually that this is sort of the main thing, right? I think like lots of females find this that when they have children there's a period of time where it's very very hard right you can't just pick up and put down research it's really really hard you kind of it takes momentum and it takes you know being embedded in the community and being at the conferences and hearing all of the current ideas and and you know being totally immersed in it so a lot of female academics have this where they have their first child and they're away for a year and then they come back for a year and then they're away for a year and it's three years really out so I think really that's the thing that's stilted stuff right that aside the being half and half in some ways it quite helps with the research because you meet people you would never meet otherwise you have the opportunity for collaboration you would never have otherwise and also you have the opportunity for engaging people in your projects right in a way that you wouldn't have otherwise so just to give you an example earlier this year this project that we did with the BBC that was also with the University of Cambridge and the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. It was a program called the Pandemic, right? Now in epidemiology, there's one big problem, which is that you can come up with these glorious mathematical models, but if you want them to really work, if you want them to be able to predict how an epidemic might spread, you have to have a real idea of where people are traveling, how far they're moving and how many people they're coming into contact with. And the only information that we had up until this point is a paper survey that was conducted 10 years ago where it was like, how many people do you reckon you met this week, right? Which is, there's limitations to how, how well, you know, that can actually be employed. So because I had this sort of platform, this opportunity came up where we got the BBC to pay for an app to be built so people could download to their smartphones that would collect their data for them and we've created this unbelievably glorious data set that now is, you know going to be released to the academic community and make a massive difference you know for years to come really and that's something that you couldn't do unless you had this double edge to your bow what's the phrase yeah. double sword to second your... string to your bow is there it? we go we'll go one of those <laughs> how has being like a more public figure changed your life away from the academic side of things has it been like because you know you I imagine you would get recognised more than you used to because you're in television shows and things like that. Like, has it been like a real positive experience for you being a public intellectual? Or, or <laughs> is, it, is, it, is it been, has it been, has it been, has it been? Oh, public <laughs> intellectual is you know, probably the title of the podcast <laughs> now. You're, you're totally screwed. No, you screwed. can't do that. You can't do it. <laughs> the other one they do in America is they invite you to conferences and they're like, we just really wanted you as a thought leader. <laughs> a thought leader. We're reaching out to you as a thought leader. <laughs> what does that mean? I what don't know. What does that mean? I don't know. Nothing, I think. Don't call me that. All right. <laughs> So has it been like quite positive? Do you like the sort of glitzy celebrity side of it? I think the glitzy celebrity side is where you're going down red carpets, right? You're getting papped. You're appearing in Hello magazine. I mean, those are celebrities, right? Okay. Whereas if you're just on BBC Four yeah. <laughs> or like okay. Radio Four in the morning. Or Number Five. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And getting the tube still. I okay. mean, it's not right. You're you not don't still like... get the tube, do you? Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I quite hate the tube. Uber's ruined my life. Yeah, no. right. <laughs> but uh, no, I do get the tube. I do get the tube. Yeah. But it's, it's been almost universally positive. It's been almost universally positive. Yeah. Like you get letters of support from people who and that just make a massive difference. You know, things that you aren't even really aware that you're having an impact on people and then the contact you just makes an enormous difference. Yeah, that's there's, nice. There's downsides too. I mean, obviously. I'll ask you a question, but it'll be hard because it won't make you sound unhumble. So I'll ask you to be humble and self-deprecating. Answer both sides of it. When it comes to outreach, what do you think you're good at? And what do, part of it do you think you're still not good at? Like you, Ooh, when you look back at question. stuff. Yeah, like what's your strength and your weakness? Okay, so I think that it's quite new to have someone who's not a middle-aged man 
<laughs> right. I think that's quite a big part of it. Yeah. I think also if I'm honest. But you can't say I'm good at being I'm good a young at not woman. Being, <laughs> I'm good at not <laughs> being a man. What, that's just what you are. <laughs> okay. All right. I think also the fact that I'm not a genius helps a lot, actually. I think the fact that. You're like a professional mathematician, though. It's not like you're like. Yeah, but I'm not like a good one. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I'm not like Marcus de Sautoy, who's like professor at Oxford okay. and professor twice because he's proper professor and he's also a professor, an outreach professor. Okay. I'm not like David Spiegelhauser, who's like, have you read some of the papers that man was writing when he what, was so 23? You think, you think you're seen as having like a common touch? Yeah, I think so. I think so. I mean, basically, I'm just a normal person who just really likes maths, basically. All right. So I think that helps. Yeah. And then I also think that I don't take myself too seriously. I'm quite happy for people to take the piss out of me, hmm. which I think helps to be a bit more approachable. Especially as a public intellectual. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. As speaking as a thought leader and an intellectual. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Right. I think that stuff helps. Yeah. But in terms of what I'm still not good at, oh my God, it's like everything. Every time I do a project, I have a little notebook where I give myself a star rating. Really? Yeah. On everything. Oh, Wow. Actually, it's not really star rating, it's a score out of 10. Right, on, um, on anything you'll do? like Every a... talk, every radio programme. YouTube videos? Uh, yeah. Does that mean that you've got star ratings for your number file appearances? Oh, yeah. <gasps> yeah, although it's slightly different when you're edited. Your performance isn't totally, do you know what I mean? It's yeah. not like totally. But yeah, totally, like with the idea, yeah, completely. How have you been going on number <laughs> files so far? Uh, so some of them I'm really happy with. What's your highest star rated one so far? Um, I think it was the Rock, Paper, Scissors, actually. Okay. Yeah. Which is my first one. Yeah, it was good. That was the first time I ever met you. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah. We've just gone downhill since, I haven't know. we? Yeah. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> you know, I'm not giving myself tens or whatever. No, no, no. But the thing is, I think it's incredibly important to look back at what you've done and acknowledge where you could improve yeah so i still do i mean i've given hundreds of public lectures now right hundreds of public talks yeah and i still do this where it's like i have a note you know little notes in every folder where i say the talk and i just say what worked and what didn't work so right. the next time yeah what's been your your biggest crash so far and what's been your like highest rating what's the what's the high and the low so far oh that's a good question have you ever got a 10 or is 10 not allowed got like close to a 10 a couple of times mm. so one actually i did an interview on sean keevney's show he's great he's brilliant i yeah. love him a lot yeah and that got a really high mark but it got a really high mark because i managed to like keep my nerves under control yeah and i was really nervous about it because it's like sean keevney yeah and i hadn't done this program before and i hadn't done loads of radio chatty radio shows before but i yeah managed to not sound like an idiot our next guest is an expert in fluid dynamics understands the trigonometry of love and can tell us a thing or two about earworms. Here to talk about... I've gone a little bit, William. Hey! Here to talk about... Theon! Here to talk about the next series of The Curious Case of Rutherford and Fry. It's Hannah Fry. Good morning. Hello, good morning. Thanks for coming in What again. an intro. It was quite good. I enjoyed that. I know, it's usually... We start well and then it goes downhill. <laughs> well, I think, if anything, it peaked up as the voice... Uh, is know, it went a bit William Hague, yeah. Because yeah. the thing is, on those kind of shows, right, you have to be really careful that you are jumping in exactly the right amount. You can't just sit there and wait for them to talk to you because it has to be a conversation. So you kind of have to jump in a little bit. Were you doing it via phone or were you in the studio? With I was you? in the studio, yeah. Okay, yeah. Which makes it easier. Yeah. But you also, you can't jump in when they're talking when it's not appropriate. Yeah. So it's really hard to, like, get that balance right. Okay. But then also just explain my thing while I was going on, just explain quite well, whatever. Yeah. But I mean, I've definitely bombed a lot of times. Like, do you ever get a zero or a one? What's like, what's the lowest mark? You oh, can get? no, because I try. I always really prepare, so I okay. don't, never get a zeros and ones. A zero like... would just be falling over on the stage and then not giving a talk at all, <laughs> <laughs> or like just going in and shouting at everyone, yeah. being like, "Hey, you all!" <laughs> and storming <laughs> off. Okay. <laughs> But I think that, you know, I've definitely got low marks where I just haven't thought enough about what the audience were wanting. So a low mark is at times where you feel like you've just missed the audience, you've missed yeah. your... Yeah, or maybe I've been a bit sloppy and I haven't prepared as well as I could have done. So one thing that I, I still not very good at, right, that Matt Parker is amazing at actually, instantly, is that if the audience is in a really good mood, 
and they're going with me, I can accelerate that. When I'm on stage, this is. I know how to accelerate that and, you know, get it to feed back on itself. But sometimes the audience just isn't in the right mood. And what Matt can do is he can turn the audience to being into him. Win them, win them back. He can win them, right? And I just haven't quite worked out how to do that yet. I haven't worked out that when you've got a bad audience, not to just be like, okay, I'm just going to say what I was going to say and that's it. And I haven't got anything else. But rather be like, what is it about you that you need? You know, do you need me to be more goofy? Do you need me to be more energetic? What is it that you need? And give them that and then turn them to your side and wear that. Let's talk about your books for a second. You've done a few now. You had a few like lighthearted, fun ones, one about love and stuff and one about Christmas and and now you've written a more hardcore one. Yeah. Tell me about the how they were different, how writing them was different. So the love one, <laughs> well, in a way, I sort of don't want anyone to ever read that book <laughs> because I'll tell you why. Okay. Link in the show notes, people. <laughs> I know you're not supposed to say this about your own work. But what happened with that book, right, was that I'd just done this talk, this TEDx talk, got an email from Ted saying, we're putting it on the main channel, we're making it a proper TED talk. It's completely unexpected, right? And then a couple of weeks later, they said, actually, what we're going to do, we're not going to put it online yet because we want you to write a book to go with it (laughs) and then we'll launch them both together. (laughs) And I was like, my God, this is amazing. I mean, I never would have written a book if someone hadn't come to me and said, you need to write a book, right? Never in a million years. And I kind of thought about it and was like, okay, I'm going to do it. And they were like, great. We need the whole book delivered in six weeks' time. <laughs> <laughs> like full-time academic, got a full-time job. You know, it's like, right, that's not really going to be possible. So I tried to negotiate with them and they were like, yeah, thing is, we're Ted. Yeah. So yeah. do you want to do it or not? Yeah. So I did it. Yeah. I mean, it was the most horrific experience of my life. A bit of it, you felt like it was a bit rushed. I, I do think it was a bit rushed. How yeah. many stars does it get in your notepad? Oh, God. I mean, a lot less than it gets on Amazon, put it that way. Right. <laughs> Is that a humble brag? I can't quite decide. <laughs> it, might be. it might be. It gets very what high saying, rating no, on Amazon. No, no, it, doesn't, no it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. But what I'm saying is that people are still being generous. Okay. That's what I mean. Okay. I mean, like, I, don't get me wrong. I mean, I think the idea is there, like taking maths and something like love and smashing them together I, I still like stand by that idea and I think there was like the kind of beginning of a of something much better there but it was just such a hard process because I'm not a natural writer and getting the ideas that wasn't my research area either right you know getting that up to the point where it's like yeah I'm really proud of this and I'm ready to release it to the world it just wasn't I just needed more time I mm. just didn't have it mm-hmm. the Christmas one on the other hand I think we did have more time with that. And I did that with as a collaboration with my colleague, Thomas Oleron Evans, who is basically a wonderful human being. And we just had loads of fun writing it and just being really silly and playful and whatever and coming up with stupid ideas and seeing them through. So that one's kind of more like what I wanted love to be, if you know what I mean. Yeah. But I really like that book. It's really, it's just a, a stupid little fun book. Yeah. But then... The latest one, the Hello World one. Yeah. I sort of see that, to be honest, as my first book. Right. Because six weeks to write a book, it's like a pamphlet, not a book. And then the other one was just me mucking around with someone. They're sort of more like stocking filler type Yeah, fun totally. Books. I mean, they're very thin, right? Yeah. They're like 25,000 words or whatever. Yeah. Whereas Hello World is like, I mean, it's still quite, well, I hope anyway that it's still got that chatty style and there's still like some silly bits in there. It's not completely serious, not like this really serious, heavy read. But it's just much more about the things that I'm actually interested in in terms of the research that I do. And also, I just think it's got some really good stories in it. Where did you write it? Where do you sit and write? On a walk, mate. You write it on a walk? Yeah. Well, you can't type <laughs> on a walk. You can dictaphone there, can't you? Oh, you dictaphone it? Yeah, so I'd go for a walk with my doggy for a really long walk and I'd dictaphone loads. Oh. And then I'd come back and I'd type it up and make it into sentences and then pad it out. And do the same next day. Have you still got the dictaphone recordings? Probably, yeah. Will you give us like 15 seconds so we can hear what that sounds like? <laughs> yeah, but my sentences are really slow. That's okay. So I'll be like... I'd love to hear what it sounds like, you know, for a peek behind the curtain. And I'll be like really heavy breathing as I'm walking yeah. up hill. <laughs> I'm going to lobby you for that. I'm going to lobby you okay, for a little... Okay, see if I can find If you one. can find some, just give us a little snippet and we'll just play it now so people can get a feel for that. On the one hand, it means that we don't, we kind of feel surprised when things get stuff wrong. 
And on the other hand, it means that we are dismissive when getting things wrong at all. We're just really bad at that stuff because we're not very good at calculating. But I sort of think, actually, a more interesting and more accurate way to frame it is to have that as a secondary idea and instead have how much power should we give the the machine. Part one is that the algorithm gets final say. Part two is that the human gets final say. Maybe the algorithm should have final say. But the problem is that you just just squish too much of this shit in. So how about we just go? Include all the AI stuff in with the algorithm bit. Then go, should you blindly follow it? Molly! Oh, sorry, I didn't see you then. I know. <laughs> Little and large. Huh? Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, she's cockpit. Oh, my goodness. Molly, what? The parts of the book that I've read, what I like about it is it does sound like you're talking to me. Like it's like, oh, yeah, this is how, this obviously. I was. <laughs> yeah, that, it all makes more sense now. That's why I was going to say you're so good at writing in your voice, your chatty <laughs> voice. It's because you are. It is your chatty voice. How has it been going? Like how was it received? I know it's been nominated for some awards and yeah, stuff. So it's has. obviously, uh, you know. It has. No, it's really, it's really been really good actually. It's been really amazing because I think <laughs> one thing that I do find about it is that I think because I have done quite silly stuff in the past, like the love stuff and, you know, telly stuff, whatever. I think one thing that I've noticed is that people think I don't know what I'm talking about. Right. It's sort of back to what we were saying earlier. About yeah. Walking into a room, people thinking you're an idiot. I don't think people think I'm an idiot, but I think they don't. I yeah. think people are a bit like, why is this TV presenter writing a book about AI? Yeah. You know, she's jumping on the bandwagon or whatever. Yeah, yeah. But it's not really. I mean, it's stuff that I've been working on for a really long time. It's been nominated for two awards, right? Shortlisted for two awards. And one of them was the Royal Society, which is like a really big deal because when it comes to science writing, you just don't really get a bigger institution than the Royal Society. Hmm. And, you know, the books that they pick are like these weighty, you know. Tomes. Exactly. I mean, <laughs> they really are. It's like, you know, a history of engineering right yeah. like that was one of the other books yeah. or like what well, i find quite intimidating books yeah and why i was a real surprise was because exactly as you said the book that i've written is really chatty it's not written in the style of a scientist really yeah so it's really that was really amazing to get that recognition and then the the other one the other big prize that it's been nominated for is this non-fiction like the biggest non-fiction award which is anything in the english language so i think there's only a couple of english authors on there which is frankly absurd I mean, science books almost never even get on this list. So it's Brilliant. Said. Brilliant. But, you know, it's actually, I did try really hard. <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. You, you did something right. So you get to dip your oar into a lot of the different types of outreach now. You've got, like, you know, radio and podcasts. It's really successful. You've done these television shows, a book. Occasionally you even get to be in number five videos, which is amazing. <laughs> you know, actually, though, in terms of people, like, coming and talking to me in the street, it's almost always number five people. Oh, there you go. They're the best There people. you go. Well, keep doing them then. So of all of those, and I would, there is no offence to be taken here, what gives you the most pleasure? Like, what, what are the ones, like, if, if I said, all right, you can't do any of it anymore except one, what's the one that, like, you know, feels most in your wheelhouse that you enjoy doing? So I, I well, I actually have this conversation quite often with my husband who's like, you need to give up something. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, stop those number five videos, man. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but the problem is, is that actually each of them have their own merits mm. and I think that they all sort of add to this bigger picture so you know the radio stuff I just absolutely love the team that I that I have so you know it's a podcast called The Curious Cases of Rutherford and Fry with Adam Rutherford the geneticist and it's just me him and this producer and we just have the best time making these programs it's just I wouldn't give it up for anything and just absolutely love it the telly stuff is like those are the times where you get these incredible experiences. I mean, it's hard work. Don't get me wrong, right? Yeah. And you do not make your fortune in no. television. Believe me. But that's about the access to play. It's, yeah. yeah, but it's about the, the experiences and the access, mm. and then you know being part of something that eventually gets seen by so many people or that just looks really beautiful and glossy on the surface. And mm. yeah, having that role, I think, is really I wouldn't want to give that up. 
Yeah. And then the YouTube stuff is where you can actually be yourself, right? It's where you can actually talk about the ideas that you think are interesting to the audience who want to hear them and get immediate feedback on them and actually kind of communicate with people who are like you. I wouldn't ever want to give that stuff up. Yeah. And then the books, that's where you get to really author something, where you get to think about an idea wholly and completely and just, you know, spend tens of thousands of words getting your own thoughts on a page. So I wouldn't want to give that up either. And then your husband says, well, you've got to give one of them up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You sleep when you're dead. <laughs> so like to finish up then, like in five years time, What's the next thing? Or do you not know? You're waiting for someone to offer it to you. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I think everything's worked out quite well so far being micro ambitious. Yeah. So just looking at what's immediately in front of you and doing the very best that you can at that and trying your hardest. Is mathematics still a big part of it? Like, do you think in 10, 15 years, you're still going to be someone who's like churning out papers and researching or like? I hope so. I hope so. So, I mean, as I said, you know, I'm just about to go on maternity leave again. So like I, in the last couple of years, I haven't done as much maths as I'd want to. And I won't again for another year or so hmm. because, you know, the new baby. But when I come back from that maternity leave, yeah, I really want to get back into it because it's just nothing in the world gives me more pleasure than getting totally stuck into a totally delicious math problem. Well, Hannah Fry, public intellectual, <laughs> nice. thought leader, thank you for your time today. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> So that's it for today. Rest assured, I will try to learn what mark out of 10 Hannah gives herself for today's interview. And I'll also do my best to get a look at that manuscript of Free as a Bird. It could be one of the great unpublished novels. On a more serious note, in the podcast description today, I'm going to have links to all sorts of stuff we discussed. The books, podcasts, and of course, Hannah's number file video appearances. Thank you to the Mathematical Sciences Research Institute, MSRI, for its support of the show, and also to the Berkeley-based audio company, Maya Sound, which made this episode possible. Links to both of them can also be found in the usual places. We'll be back again soon with another episode. There's a few good ones recorded that I'm editing just at the moment, so I can't wait to share those with you. Also, please do consider subscribing to the podcast if you've not done that already. And if it's possible, we'd also love like a rating or a review, all that kind of good stuff. It helps make the podcast just like that little bit more successful and increases the probability we'll get to make more of them later. Anyway, bye for now. <laughs>